thank you, Zelaya, for being here. This is the initial kickoff of what we're calling Fellows in Focus. And the goal here is really to get to know you, kind of help the, the whole division, the hem hematology oncology transplant division, get to know our fellows. And so our goal is to keep profiling our fellows over the course of the year and um, have that out there so that we can you know, know you outside of the, the hospital a little bit more. Okay. Uh, particular for me, I don't always see the fellows, so it's really fun for me. It's going to be really fun for me to uh, get to know everyone. So with that in mind, let's start off with just kind of getting to know you. What okay. Tell us about your upbringing and, and, you know, ultimately what brought you into medicine. Okay, sure. Um, So I grew up in Egg Harbor Township, New Jersey, which is like a suburb of Atlantic City, New Jersey. Um. I have one brother, an older brother, and then my parents. So it's just like four of us in the house and we're, we're all pretty close. Um, and then it's kind of interesting. Uh, my mom and all of like my aunties and uncles also raised like my first cousins as though we're all siblings. So um, I have technically one sibling, but I feel like all my first cousins are also my siblings. <laughs> um, so we're just all really close. And then... Um, there are a few things that kind of introduced me to medicine. Um, so my parents always made everything with my brother and I, like a field trip kind of thing. And so my brother has hemoglobin SC. And so going to his pediatric hematologist appointments were like a family field trip kind of thing. <laughs> uh, and so, um, you know, I remember the visits. I remember his doctor, Dr. Travis, like talking to me and explaining things to me and him at the same time. Also like uh, letting us look at like blood slides under the microscope. And I think from then is when I really wanted to be a doctor. Um, and at first I was like a little undifferentiated. Um, and so then a couple other things in my life affirm that for me. Um, as my grandparents aged and I just saw different things come up in their health and just realizing um, that sometimes there was like a lack of uh, medical literacy like in my family or like, you know, there was like a disconnect. And so that further like impassioned me to be the type of doctor who patients can reiterate what's going on and really understand what, what's going on. And then as I aged and I realized that my brother's um, sickle cell phenotype was more, less severe than others, um, that kind of made me feel like I wanted to be an advocate for people who weren't quite as fortunate as my brother. And so that's what kind of like led me to hematology. And um, so I went into medical school already knowing I wanted to be a hematologist. <laughs> and I kind of just went through my career path with that in mind. Yeah, we should recruit your your brother's pediatric hematologist into our uh, yeah. faculty recruitment initiatives. You were doing hematology probably the earliest of anybody I've heard of that didn't have I a know. doing it. <laughs> yeah, I wonder, I, I, I know she worked out of like um, South Jersey, Children's of Philadelphia. And like my brother used to go to like the Ronald McDonald like sickle cell camps. And I was always jealous that I did. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, she was she was really great. Dr. Travis, I don't remember what her first name is. And I wonder if she still practices because this is probably early 90s. So I don't I well, know. I should start recruiting my patient's siblings like <laughs> you did or like you were <laughs> with their peripheral smears and such. Yes. And yes. As part of their regular clinic. It'll this work. is how we develop our hematologists from the it from works. The this is it great. Works. <laughs> <laughs> All these tips we're learning in our for our heme focus fellowship. There we go. <laughs> start them young. Um Speaking of fellowship, obviously you're doing the traditional path because we didn't have the Heme Focus Fellowship mm -hmm. at the time, presuming that that would have been a good fit for you. Yeah. But why did you choose Minnesota in the first place? Yeah. So again, it's always been this like singular focus of sickle cell. So um, when I was interviewing for residency, I interviewed at a few uh, physician scientist training programs because in medical school, I worked with uh, Dr. Devon at Vanderbilt and I did a one year out research experience through the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. And so I already had solidified, of course, that I wanted to be a hematologist and I wanted to be sickle cell. And so when I was interviewing, I actually came to Minnesota because of the physician scientist training program. And I interviewed um, that day with Dr. Versalati, Dr. Belcher, Dr. Gupta, who was here at the time. And I felt like of all the places that I interviewed, this was a place that actually 
was on the cutting edge of sickle cell disease. They had like an established basic science lab and they had people that were, had dedicated their careers to it. So I just felt like it would be a good place for me personally for mentorship and to further my research career. Yeah, I think that sometimes the Minnesota, one doesn't get the credit it deserves for the, the particularly for the classical yeah. hematology for the history of it, yeah, you know, including two previous ASH presidents, but also the ability, you know, in particularly in John and, and Greg's labs to take things truly bench to bedside as we are currently yeah. Yeah. with phase one trials. It's really exciting and I think yeah. underappreciated on the global or the, the national scale. Yeah. That kind of work we have here. Yeah. So good work. Cool. So so PTSP <laughs> was an, an interest, of course, and it sounds like obviously sickle cell research and working with Mike Debon is, yeah. is was probably a you know a godsend in terms of getting that early experience with an incredible researcher. 100%. Um, so tell us about your research now. What are the research interests uh, that you are pursuing at this time? Yeah, so I have um, a few uh, things going on at the same time. Uh, right now, just because of the strength of like our program in bench research and like basic science research, I'm doing a lot with Dr. Versalati and Dr. Belcher in the lab. Um, so we're actually going to have an oral presentation at ASH this year um, for a project that I worked on last year uh, about cold-induced uh, vasoocclusion and hyperalgesia being blocked by complement. So a lot of the work that I've been involved in with them is complement related. So my next steps in the lab are kind of looking at um, complement and the role it has in like sickle cell lung disease potentially. And then um, I'm also interested in doing like a feasibility trial for the use of a comp daily complement inhibition for sickle cell to see if it has any effect on quality of life. And then also like frequency of vasoocclusive crises. Um, but long term, I think my career will probably take me more into the clinical research side of things, maybe translational, but mostly clinical. And so with you, I have a few <laughs> projects going on. One uh, is a quality improvement project looking at um, the rates of vaccinations in our patient population for both peds and adults and trying to standardize what we do uh, across the board for our, our patients with sickle cell disease and making sure they get their recommended vaccinations. And then another project, just looking at language in um, the medical record system and how that kind of impacts patient care, both positively and negatively. That's great. Um, and congratulations on the ASH abstract. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's, and it's an oral abstract, which is even better. Yeah. Um, thinking about the, the compliment, was that this compliment in sickle cell disease? How familiar were you with this before you got connected with Greg and John? Not at all. <laughs> Not at all familiar. It's been definitely a learning process. Um, I think, you know, it's definitely not a new concept and it's been around, but it wasn't something I really, really thought about um, until becoming a fellow here. Yeah, so that takes a lot of you kind of diving into that perhaps uncomfortable situation, at least from a, an ignorance yeah. of the topic standpoint, but also you know, it takes um, people kind of guiding you in the right direction or mentors, yes. essentially, um, to to make sure both that <clears throat> feeling comfortable and, and proud that you can do the work, but also kind of getting you there so that you are, you know, meeting these milestones like an oral abstract as a fellow, which is excellent. Yeah, it's it's definitely been a steep learning curve. <laughs> <laughs> But Dr. Versalati and Dr. Belcher have been very gracious in guiding me up that hill. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's been good. That's good. And as somebody who, as a fellow myself, did both clinical and basic science research, I know that there's a push and pull that can be yeah. uh, somewhat hard to straddle. But I think you come out of it on the other side, kind of able to manage almost anything, especially time-wise. Yeah. You have a better relationship with your time management, I think. <laughs> Out yeah, I'm still working on that, <laughs> but <laughs> it's coming along. It's coming along. Good. So who, speaking of mentors, and it can be multiple and it doesn't have to be here, but who, who do you consider to be your mentors and how do they mold you into who you are today? Either as a professional or as a person. Yeah, I think one of my biggest influences has been Dr. Devon. So I met him in 2013. So my first year of medical school. So just a little bit of a background. I've always been someone who, you know, 
I, I recognize that I'm not traditionally what people, what I, what people think a doctor looks like. Right. And, and that has come into play a lot in my life in terms of like this road and like getting this journey. There's been a lot of people that tell me like, Oh, you know, you shouldn't do it or you can't do it or or you get a nurse or these, you know, these things. So early in my career, meeting Dr. Devon was a game changer because there was this constant person like this constant cheerleader for me a constant person who definitely never made it seem like my goals were too big for me to reach or unattainable and so like meeting him first year in medical school I think was a game changer um throughout medical school it just connect kept me connected with like the disease and the population that I really wanted to study like the reason why I did medicine and then um you know, there were some ups and downs in medical school, of course. And, you know, he really, he really took the time to guide me through all those ups and downs and really, um, you know, showed me that he personally cared about my career and was personally invested. And at the time in med school with like all the challenges, I really needed that. And so, um, so I, you know, he's like, you know, I thank God for him all the time because I do think that I wouldn't necessarily be here without him or the road would have been bumpier without him, um, for sure. So I'm so thankful for his mentorship. And then I think that kind of laid the groundwork for what I know how to do. Like he always pushed me like um, in the beginning of med school, before I even had patient contact, he would throw me in the room with his pediatric patients and say, get the H and P and, you know, or like I'd go to his clinic and he'd say, okay, write the orders for an exchange transfusion. And I'm like, I don't know how to write these things, <laughs> but it kind of pushed me out of my comfort zone and got me more comfortable, um, in uncomfortable situations. And I think that's something that's carried through. And so now being here, you know, working with Dr. Versalati who, and Dr. Belcher, who are my main mentors, and then you and Dr. Beckman, um, it's been, I think I'm a little more equipped to rise to the occasion. I still think I, you know, fall short sometimes, but <laughs> I think I'm a little more equipped. And, you know, I definitely don't think I would be able to do all the things that I'm able to do now without the learning that I had back then in terms of research and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I've only briefly met Dr. Vaughn, but I know that one, I, I know his reputation and he's an excellent mentor for young trainees and, and particularly for minority uh, physicians and, and uh, trainees of all levels, because I, I think he's really passionate about it. But as you said, and I've sort of observed this, is he's not going to sort of, um, it's, it's not always going to be um, sort of a cuddly environment that may be putting you in that oh, discomfort zone. You know, that's his personality, <laughs> but I think he's successful with it. And I yeah. think sounds not like at you, all cuddly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It sounds like you have uh, you know thrived because of that, you know, because mm-hmm. of that mentorship. Definitely. Which is really what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to persist past a short period of your training time and really sort of mold you into who you are, which is yeah. amazing. Exactly. So yeah, thanks for sharing. Of course, yeah. of course. So what do you see postgraduate here and, and you know, or maybe even project five, 10 years down the road? What do you, what do you <laughs> see yourself doing? That's the big question. I have, um, I think one time I actually talked to Dr. Debon about like what I want to do. And he was like, you just explained 10 lifetimes of gold. <laughs> <laughs> and like, you know, th- for diff- three different people or something. So Um, there are a lot of things. I definitely do want to stay involved in the research and I do want to stay involved in, um, clinical care for people with with sickle cell disease. So, um, I know that I want to keep going with my research and hopefully have a K and R down the line. Um, I know that at some point, I think I would like to be the director of a sickle cell program. I don't think that would be sorry, my dog. I don't think that would be as like soon right out of graduation, but like maybe later down the, my career line. Um, I don't know what region of the country I want to be in. So I have a lot of question marks, but I know that 
Um, my passion for this disease population is forever. And so I know it's going to be something involving sickle cell. And, you know, I'm open to the evolution of things as I grow and age in my career. Maybe that leads me to some sort of policy or like leadership and ash or something. I'm open to that. Um, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and as you said, you've been, you've been trained and sort of it's been ingrained in you to do sickle cell since you were yeah. in such an elementary school. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. Basically. That's awesome. Um, you know, and then to change gears a little bit, obviously we, we want people to have lives outside of work. <laughs> yeah. So what do you like to do for fun? And, you know, what is your s- social support system? Yeah. Um, how do you balance the toils of fellowship? Yeah. So in Minnesota, I don't have a lot of support. I have a significant other who is wonderful to me. And so like these last couple months have been busy and I literally have not cooked a dinner in the last <laughs> two months. So he's been very supportive to me. Um, and then, you know, he is a big movie person and I have, I am a big movie person, but he's opened me up to some like Marvel genres and like different <laughs> things that aren't traditionally my thing. Um, but things that I love to do in particular, I love to like rollerblade and skate. I love to crochet. And so those are like my happy places and it's kind of how I get my exercise. Um, I started actually, well, I actually roller skated since I was a kid. My dad used to take us to the roller rink every Saturday. And then I picked it up again in med school and like got my own skates and started learning how to like dance on the skates. And so that's nice. something that I really like to do. <laughs> that's like a little bit. Yeah, I did not know the skill set about you. In yes. Sense. Yes. I'm a little bit of a good skater. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so that is like one of my favorite things to do. And it's like actually de-stressing. I live in um Brooklyn Park now, but when I lived in St. Paul, I had all hardwood floors and I would like move the furniture and after work I would skate around there and like <laughs> skate around the gym. Like, yeah, I really if I could skate all the time I would. Um and so I definitely love that. And then the rest of my support system is back in Jersey. I have my brother who is like my best friend and has been, besides Dr. DeBond, my biggest cheerleader. Like when everyone thought I couldn't do it, he was one person who never, ever, ever doubted my ability. And he will always say, like, uh, my favorite thing about my sister is that when she gets her puts her mind to something she does it like she is like a dog with a bone or a horse with blinders like when she decides she's going to do something she just does it and so he is my biggest cheerleader and his wife is my best friend (laughs) um and so I lean on them a lot for support and then my parents so that's that's mostly my main support system I have friends here too and stuff but those are my my big go-tos yeah and it can be hard certainly you know being afar you know particularly in in, you know and I've done it within my own training to be apart from family by several states away so yeah yeah I'm glad that you do have that remote system as well yeah Um, and thankfully things are easier to connect than you know everything gets easier to connect with yes with uh far away support systems so yeah so if you weren't a physician what would you be doing oh that is a hard question like based on my skill set or just I can magically Whatever, like, have say, any yeah. skill. Whatever your if I could about. magically have every any skill, I would be a ballerina. Okay. Yeah, I just love dance. I love ballet. I am like obsessed with it, and um, I just think it's so beautiful. So if there was something that I could do, and I had, I do not have the skill set to do ballet, but if <laughs> I could, if I did, that is something I would love to do. Um. Yeah, I think that's what I would do. It probably I comes out in your skate dancing a little bit. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit, but I'm not graceful enough to be a ballerina. <laughs> <laughs> and then pretend you're a travel agent. Sell me on a place that I should go and why. Oh. Hmm. That is a good question. I would say New Orleans. It's actually my favorite um, city in the United States, like 100%. So I think it's just like one of the most vibrant cities in the United States. I think it's, there's just so much culture and the, like the food and the people, the accents. There's just so much that's beautiful about it. I remember um, I went for the first time in med school 
because I went to med school in Nashville. So it was like a drive. So my friends and I, my med school friends, we would drive there like a couple times a year. And I remember like one Sunday, um, there was just like, we were getting ready to leave and there was just like a parade, right? Like for no reason. It's randomly, like, yeah. Yeah, like no reason in the streets. And, and people were just like walking down the street and dancing. And there was just like so much joy and so much happiness, you know? And just randomly for no reason on a Sunday, there's just joy. So um, I love New Orleans. It's like, I, I just think it's a beautiful city. I think it has so much culture. And I think the people there have really figured out how to tap into like pure joy well then i think it's perfect that you'll be presenting at Ashley <laughs> yeah. in, in, in i'm December. very excited <laughs> yeah it is fun it's a fun meeting there so yeah i'm very excited well it's been a pleasure chatting we are kind of at the end of our fellows in focus okay. here the session thank you so much for sharing is there anything else that you'd want to share that we don't know about you or no i think i shared a lot <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you, Zalea. It's been a pleasure. We look forward to doing other fellows in the future. And, um, you know, this is an exciting way to expose our, our broader faculty to our clinical yeah. fellows. This is fun. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Al.